Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Dear listener, what is the one thing you can do that could completely change your life? But Jess, how can I choose just one thing? I know, I know, hear me out. Everything is energy. Each action you take leads you somewhere. It can either keep you in alignment or pull you out of it. And alignment is constantly fluctuating, changing with you. So in a way, every single thing you do matters. No pressure. From your first thoughts in the morning to what you're having for dinner, it all adds up. Just keep that in mind. Today's guest is someone who identified the one thing that was holding her back from fully showing up. And it might be different for everyone, but I'm so excited to share her story. Her name is Karolina Jakowalska. Karolina is a certified alcohol-free life coach and founder of Euphoric Alcohol Free. She works with health-conscious and personal growth-oriented women who find that their gray area drinking is not aligned with their deeper values anymore. She helps women transform their relationship with alcohol by experimenting with a break so that they can unlock another level of health, happiness, and potential in their lives and find new passions and purpose. Carolina has been alcohol-free since February 2018 and has used her empowering AF identity to achieve her greatest dreams, including working for herself while making an impact, building her passion business, and writing a book. Euphoric will be out in bookstores in January 2022. In addition to working with soul seekers to transform their relationships with alcohol, she also specializes in the beautiful aftermath of finding freedom, giving voice to new dreams and goals. Carolina lives in San Diego with her husband and sweet Samoyed. In today's episode, Carolina shares how alcohol became this magical elixir for her as a teenager to be more open and extroverted. And then slowly started to notice her weekend drinking was affecting other areas of her life, getting into the roots of her limited beliefs associated with alcohol, stumbling upon scientific studies that explain why she felt the way she did. Hint, hint, alcohol affects our pleasure system. The social pressure, stigma, and dialogue around alcohol and how giving up alcohol has opened her up for more possibilities and ways of being. Rather, you're interested in an alcohol-free life or just curious about it, come join this inspiring conversation. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk a little bit more about what you do and share your story. So where are you from? Uh, My parents are from Poland, so they immigrated in the 80s. Um, I was born here, though, but yeah. A lot of family in Poland used to go back a lot. Well, before COVID, I would go right. every <laughs> <laughs> Nice. So how did you settle in San Diego? Um, they came to they came to San Diego actually first, but by the time I was born, they are in Orange County. So just we've been in SoCal ever since, really. Yeah, I haven't really moved. <laughs> <laughs> but you've done a bit of traveling, right? I think I read in your about section, you travel with your Samoy. What's it? The- What's his name again? Exley. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. He's my favorite thing. <laughs> he's super uh-huh. sweet. Yeah. I love traveling. So it's obviously a little harder right now, but I've actually taken a few trips like where I could this year. Even I went to um, the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. I've gone to Mexico yeah. a few times. Now they're making it, I mean, with good reason, but now it's harder because yeah. now to get back <laughs> in the United States, you need um, a negative test. Whereas before we were completely unrestricted, like, we could go wh- wherever they were accepting us before, you know, and mm-hmm. now, you know, it's a lot harder. I don't know how it is in Canada. 
I think it's been similar in a, in a way that we had to get a, I think you had to quarantine when you came back, but mm-hmm. I don't, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> I have friends who've like come in and out, but we stayed in the city for the major part. That's why I'm like craving for more nature and ocean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. You're a certified alcohol life coach. What came first? Were you a life coach before you added in the um, non-alcohol component? (laughs) Yeah, so um, I had a life transformation myself. You know, I always call myself like a social weekend drinker. I thought I was doing what every other 20-ish year old was doing with their life. I was going out with my friends. I was drinking some wine on a Friday night with Netflix at home. And I was living this cycle on repeat for a decade, right? I literally was working in a a nonprofit job that was okay, but not like my exact calling. And I lived for the weekend. You know, I couldn't wait for Friday night. And I repeated this cycle for so long that I could tell that I would try to be so healthy and productive during the week. You know, I would eat well, I would work out. And then every weekend, just my entire health goals, my life goals, everything just went on total pause. I would over drink and I'd wake up on Monday morning just feeling like crap and just really feeling kind of depressed as well. Like what, you know, I'm back at square one again. I always felt like that. Although I never thought I could really make changes. You know, the only kind of stories I ever heard of people that stopped drinking were, you know, they crashed their car, they got a DUI, they have to go to AA, like very, very serious stuff. And I always thought to myself, well, if I stop drinking, that's like admitting to the world that I have this kind of problem. And so instead of just being really authentic to what my emotions and my intuition was trying to tell me, I kept pushing it down and just saying, no, society tells me normal adults drink. It's what's normal. Just keep trying to make it work. And so really it was like trying to find it like, like to find the balance was almost like elusive for me. You know, it was like always trying to put on shoes that are just too tight. It just wasn't working. You know, I remember even there were so many nights where I had exactly how much I wanted to drink, maybe just one or two drinks. And I still woke up the next morning feeling more tired, feeling more like depressed, just feeling unaligned with how I wanted to have my mood for the day. Fast forward, I learned a lot of science about why that is but what I finally did is I, I decided to take a break from drinking. I finally got almost the courage I needed to just say, why don't I just take a month off, see what happens, like really, you know, get in tune with what's going on here. And then I can go back if I want to. And the month ended up just opening my eyes so much. I, I really fell in love with a new way of being. And I started diving in way more into all of the kind of conditioning we received, you know, to become drinkers in the first place. I mean, it's no coincidence that most of us start and pick it up as teenagers, yeah. right? I started learning a lot about the science behind alcohol, how it interacts with the brain and the neurochemistry. And I really started learning that the way I was reacting to it wasn't different. It was actually the exact way my brain was meant to react to an addictive substance like that. I started learning too how a lot of the reasons why I like to drink were actually caught up in really self-limiting beliefs. You know, like, so I'm an introvert and I, I um, thought I was really shy when I was younger So when I found alcohol as a teenager, it was like this magical elixir, you know, that helped me turn into an extrovert. And really, I was using it to access this part of me that I didn't believe I could access on my own. I didn't believe I could be interesting or fun or bubbly at a party without a drink in my hand. And so that even belief that like alcohol makes me fun was rooted in this really disempowering belief that I'm no fun without alcohol, which is, you know, when you say it like that, it's just like, whew. You know, and so I had to actually get to the real root reasons of why I had built up alcohol in life in my life in the first place and deconstruct those beliefs and really find and replace them with really empowering ones. Um, now it's something I do with all of my clients. And it's like this magic formula that I found to really kind of step away from the societal conditioning, listen to your emotions. They're trying to teach you something. Don't numb them and uncover and disrupt those limiting beliefs that are holding you back in a habit that might not be helping you grow into the version of yourself you want to grow into. I love how you talked about like the science a little bit more because for someone who might be in a similar situation where they see nothing wrong with it, if they feel crappy Monday, just 
call it, oh, it's Monday, everybody's meant to feel crappy. You know, it adds to those layers of why we don't listen to ourselves. But then, like you said, you were looking to the signs and how it reacted. What are some of the symptoms you noticed that were sensitive for you? Yeah, so I wish I knew this back then, but you know, <laughs> alcohol, we think of it as something that affects our pleasure system. And it does, it does help, it does release the brain, it has an artificial spike of dopamine when we drink. The thing is that initial reward that our brain gets lasts very shortly, it lasts about 20 minutes. And our body has this counterbalancing system so that because alcohol is such a depressant and stimulates that reward system in our body, our body has a way to counterbalance that. And what it actually does is our body releases stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline in our body, as well as another neurochemical called dynorphin, which is actually something that makes you feel really depressed. It's like the mm. opposite of endorphins. And so after you drink, this, these are the neurochemicals that are flooding your body. You're feeling the cortisol, adrenaline, dynorphin. And it's like, there's a reason why these, that, that term anxiety, you know, the next day you feel blue, you feel low, you feel tired, maybe even a little regretful. You just feel like behind. And it's like, cause you're literally, you're, you're feeling these, the, the emotional aspect of these, of these neurochemicals going through your body. And if you drink every weekend, you know, not to like, to put any judgment on that, but it's just eye opening to realize it takes about a week for these chemicals to completely like rebalance and detoxify from your body. So if you drink every weekend, like I was, I had no idea what my natural state even felt like, you know? And so I allowed myself, you know, by taking my break, I allowed my body to really kind of recalibrate to its natural levels. And what I found was I became euphoric. And that's why I call my company and my coaching euphoric is because when those chemicals rebalance, like drinking also lowers your natural levels of dopamine over time, your natural levels of serotonin and your natural levels of GABA, meaning that you could feel apathetic all the time. And that's really just the effect of alcohol. And when you would remove it, those good neurochemicals go up and the bad ones go down and you can just feel a lot, a lot happier. Plus, because you're not numbing your emotions or drinking over them, even just slight ones like, oh, I feel uncomfortable or, you know, I'm a little stressed out. They're actually trying to teach you all the time what you need in your life. They're trying to teach you, you know, how you need to heal yourself, how you need to take care of yourself, what boundaries you might need or what shifts you need in your life. So back to my story, you know, I felt like I was drinking and living for the weekend every week. Well, obviously I was unfulfilled in what I was doing with my life, right? And when I finally saw that, I made changes right away. You know, I started getting trained to become a coach. I knew I always wanted to work for myself. I launched my own business. I left my day job. I did all these things that finally helped me step into that kind of dream life. I, I wouldn't have known before, you know, it was just something that kept getting shoved down. And, you know, you can see that in so many unhealthy coping mechanisms, we feel unfulfilled. And then we do something to almost ignore the fact that we feel unfulfilled, whether it's social media or video games, or eating too much, you know, all these kinds of things can kind of, when you're really ready to get introspective about it, can kind of point to uh, underlying kind of root cause. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting because you mentioned, you know, feeling guilt and shame, and it's part of, you know, the science behind it. But I also know a lot of people attached to shame, and they feel guilty as if they did it themselves. But like, Honestly, with all the conditioning that we have, and even drinking, it's such a normal thing that how do you learn to disassociate from that guilt and shame? And then to take, you know, I'm going to do something different. That must have been such a courageous call and scary as well. Yeah, yeah, it was back then. And I mean, now I feel grateful because there's just so much more conversation around this, you know, like just take a break, just experiment, just try it. <laughs> like there's nothing, it doesn't say anything about you, right? It just says that you want to live life like aligned with your deeper values, you know, and if health is one of them or living holistically, spiritually is one of your values, then there's nothing wrong with taking a break. But I think that healing of that, like parts of yourself you don't like or the shame of what you've done before is so important. And it's actually a critical component of my programs and my coaching is to really come to first learn all about these scientific, societal, um, you know, the neuro associative associations, we have all of that stuff to learn that there's nothing wrong with you. You're reacting exactly as you should to alcohol. However, you know, like just because it's not wrong, there's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't mean your comfort zone like is serving you, right? Like it's just a comfort zone essentially. 
And so once they learn that, you know, you can really get to a point of accepting yourself, accepting your story, accepting what's happened, accepting the way the patterns has and habits have built up in your life. Maybe even telling people like in a private group or with friends you can confide in and forgiving yourself. And there's just like a wash that comes over you, you know, like this, this, this idea that the past is not equal to future. And especially when you start showing up and doing something different, you know, by taking a break, you start to build up some pride and confidence in that, you know, it's like, this was my Achilles heel, but now look at me, I'm going 10, 20, 30, 50 days without alcohol. It just starts to snowball your pride and confidence. And that starts to overfill into other areas of your life. You know, because you, if you never imagine not drinking for like 60 days or something and you do it, well, what else have you been telling yourself you can't do <laughs> that you really could? Right. It's almost as if you step into a version of yourself that you didn't believe that it was possible before. Absolutely. And it, it just snowballs from there, you know, and I love to say that it's really not about the fermented beverage at the end of the day. It's about clearing the space, you know, like all this mental time and energy is sometimes spent over this drink. Should I, shouldn't I, how much, when, you know, all this stuff. It's clean, clearing the space so that you can invite in like your true passion and purpose in a life. And what's really cool is like almost all of my clients find that. Like they they declutter the, the alcohol conditioning they've received. And what comes in its place is this stronger connection to their intuition. And then they know they discover their dreams again and they start going for them. You know, I have clients writing books. I have clients that are launching businesses, creating courses, like quitting their jobs and moving, like just all this incredible stuff. And personally, I did all of that too. You know what I mean? It's just, it's so life affirming. Tell me a little bit about your process when you first started deciding, okay, no more alcohol and sharing it with the people around you. How was, how did everything come together? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it was almost like this just, intuitive spark that I got from my intuition. Again, when I created the space, it's like alcohol was always this like chatter in my brain, right? You know, and there was the the guilt, the shame, the should I, the shouldn't I, the rumination, you know, where, when, how, you know, and all of a sudden there was silence and I could just hear that voice from my intuition. And she told me, you know, you need to share your story. You need to launch a website. You need to start talking about this. You need to become a coach. You need to launch a business. And I remember how terrified I was, you know, I like, I went public on my Facebook page, you know, back, back a few years ago. And it was so scary because nobody talks about alcohol. (laughs) Right. And to put it in a way that you're not an alcoholic, because I think there's also so much labels and stigma attached. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's like, why so many of us are so stuck in the first place. You know what I mean? And, and the thing that like with labels and, and things like that, like, we are such multifaceted human beings. You know, our patterns do not define us, especially not like the one, these old patterns that we clung to that maybe served us at some point of our lives, but just don't fit who we're growing into be. Yeah, definitely. What are some common blocks and major resistance when people come to you? Yeah, absolutely. So It's interesting. I think that most of the time, most people think of drinking not as something to do out of sadness, right? Like most clients I work with wouldn't identify like, oh, I'm so depressed. So I drink. It's it's kind of the opposite. We drink because we want to celebrate. We want to pamper ourselves. We want to relax, right? But even within those moments of finding, well, where can I find that those stuff within me? How can I find that same level of comfort and fun or relaxation, or just even giving myself the permission to relax, how can I find that within myself? And even believing that these are states that you can access on your own. Like what we really want is a state change in your brain, right? These are things that we can create in our lives organically, holistically, without outsourcing it to alcohol and all the negative side effects that come with that. And I think even having this like ability to see that like your relaxation, your sense of feeling pampered, your sense of feeling sophisticated, your sense of feeling like confident or outgoing, they're all within you. And when you start to tap into it and discover how you can do that, ooh, the power goes to you. You know, you're not outsourcing it to something else, to something outside of you. And I think that can be really, really powerful and and ob- all obviously something that's kind of unique to every person, but that every person can kind of um, get 
the, to experience like their own journey of finding those kinds of things for themselves. So it's like we find what needs alcohol was needing and then we have to recreate those. And I love to use the phrase organic joy because there's immediate gratification in a glass of alcohol. Like I said, there's that hit of dopamine. But you know what? There's that same thing in heroin and cocaine and video games and all these things that are bad for us. Gambling, you know? And over time, like I said, they just erode the actual pleasure center in the brain. And so being able to find where you get long-term fulfillment, where you get contentment from, is a totally different thing. And that's the stuff that's sustainable and long-lasting and way more aligned with your kind of, I think, path in life, you know, finding the things that bring us deep meaning and purpose is so much bigger than, you know, this immediate gratification in a glass. And so when I say organic joy, it's like, what really makes you happy, you know, and, and allow yourself to find the, the an experiment with what that is, you know, and, and look beyond just oh, it's a glass of wine with my girlfriends on Friday night, right? Yeah, that's probably something around that. You love the connection of it. So how can we recreate that for yourself? How do you, how would, what would you say to someone who is interested in trying maybe like a dry January and they're out in a social setting, maybe not nowadays, but when they do eventually go out in a social setting, everyone's drinking around them and they might be put in the spot. What yeah. are some tools you have to navigate that? Absolutely. So I have a, I have a great guide actually, it's called how to rock a party sober. Um, but some of the things to like, remember is that in most areas of life, we love to be independent. We love to be rebellious. We love to be forward thinking. For example, if you wanted to like go back to school and get a master's degree, you wouldn't need all your friends to do it too. Like you would just do it for yourself. And so starting to think of yourself as the rebel in your friend group, not like the, the person with all oh, poor thing, they can't drink. No, the rebel who's like putting their health first and their own kind of self-discovery first starts to give you a kind of different pride. And even like ordering a mocktail and then talking to someone about it, like, or, you know, there's so many incredible alcohol-free drinks on the market these days. You can get like coffee cream stout and non-alcoholic wines and all these different spirits and having those kinds of things and even having conversations about them. Like you might pique other people's interests too. There's a study that they showed that over 60% of all drinkers misuse alcohol and overdrink, right? Most people do drink above the health guidelines because the health guidelines are really, really low. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, you're not this like red flag that's like everyone's thinking about you. You actually might be shifting other people's perspective when they see you not drinking. If I went to a party five years ago and saw someone not drinking, I would have been like, huh, what, what, like, what do they have that I don't, like, they don't, you know, that's giving permission to other people and inviting other conversation. So think of yourself as a rebel, think of yourself as a role model. And, you know, like just little things, like visualize how incredible you're going to feel the next day. Like you get to go to the party and wake up the next day and run four miles if you want to. I <laughs> doubt anyone with a drink is going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. You know, it's funny. I, I'm allergic to alcohol, so I can only have a little bit. I'm also grateful for that because I have a very addictive personality. Like I can get addicted to things and coffee. I love coffee and drink a couple of cups a day, chocolate, I have a couple of bars. So I know that I need to pace myself with a lot of things that I enjoy. And with alcohol, at least growing up, I guess being a teenager, there's a lot of peer pressure, but because they could see how red I was, they were like, oh, okay, maybe she doesn't eat more. So my cues help me like, okay, stop pressuring me. I'm drinking my juice, I'm happy. But it also allows you to, be more present in the moment. Absolutely. And as funny as I've like, I've always wanted to have like a blackout moment just to see what everybody is talking about. But then when I see them talking about not remembering things, I'm like, oh, maybe I don't want to get into that state. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, it's so painful. It's like, so disheartening. Cause when you're you're not acting in align with your integrity and your values, you know, it, it's like your brain gets hijacked, you know, like it doesn't, you know, nobody likes that. Right. And, and I think like what you bring up too is such a great point. And I love your story because it's like, this isn't high school anymore. You know right. what I mean? Like I'm sure most of us are well over the age of, you know, 25 and plus, like this isn't high school anymore. And I love the name of, you know, even the topics that you bring on this podcast. It's about living aligned to who you intrinsically are, authentically are. And trust me, that person, like other people don't like you because of a drink in your glass. You know what I mean? Like other people like you because your personality, which shines even more authentically 
when you're being the real version of you, not the like uninhibited version of you that actually just has their prefrontal cortex disconnected from the rest of their brain. (laughs) So true. And when you shared about how it might, you know, even trickle something in other people, I've totally seen that too. I think people are more aware of it nowadays of what it does to them, but it's also, it's almost as if alcohol is also a gateway for you to discover yourself when you notice if there's a resistance or when you notice that you don't want to give it up maybe like for example so it's almost like a gateway to discover parts of yourself that you're like maybe I don't want to look into why I'm unhappy it is it is and that's why like you know so many people it's been labeled as like a problem like no way it's the best opportunity ever it's such an incredible opportunity there's so much self-discovery that happens with it so many deeper questions that you can really ask yourself learn about yourself and grow, you know, like problems sculpt our soul. We grow through them and discover what we really want in our life, what we really need, you know, what really makes us happy, all those kinds of things. And, you know, try and ignore the, ignore whatever signals or signs you're getting, like you're going to get a bigger wake up call one day, no matter what, you know, it's going to be in some other domain, maybe in your life, but the kind of lives we lived when we're, when we're unfulfilled and we, you know, just work for a paycheck and just drink on the weekends and just do what everyone else expects us to do, but not what we do. Like there's going to be a wake up call around that. You know, I I truly do believe that. Yeah. You nailed it in the head. (laughs) Yeah. Listen to whatever that inner calling is. What has, how did the shift happen for you when you started to see clearer and what has that enabled you to do more of? Yeah. So I think immediately I really found obviously just the physical benefits, like sleeping so much better. I had so much more energy, just feeling also euphoric, like my neurochemicals were rebalanced. I was feeling so good. I I found myself in moments of just really blissful gratitude and appreciation for the world around me, you know, like just these moments of awe and wonder that I was really like skipping over before, you know, because it's like, alcohol is this 10 artificially in my brain. Cause it's like, you know, hijacking the reward sense system, everything else kind of eh, doesn't compare. And so it's almost like I wasn't present to all those beautiful things in my life. And it's like, what true beauty when you find the most mundane things like a cloud formation or a tree to really get really incredible joy from, like, there's nothing like that kind of experience. So after that, like energy and the brain and the body kind of healing, like really the positive beliefs about myself, like I really redeveloped those. You know, I think anytime maybe you're you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to drink less or you're just trying to do something, anytime you let yourself down, you start to like erode your self-esteem because you start to erode your self-trust. You said you'd do one thing and yet you keep doing the other thing, the thing you don't want to do. And so even though I consider myself a very positive, happy person, I still had very self, low self-worth and self-esteem. And so the positive beliefs about myself just started rebuilding like intensely. And from there, all that pride and confidence that I achieved, I was just like, who says that entrepreneurs have to be like tech wizards from the Silicon Valley? Maybe I could be an entrepreneur. Maybe I could write a book. Maybe I could launch a podcast. Maybe I could run a half marathon. So it was this like questioning of all the beliefs that didn't serve me before all the stories I made up about myself to keep me stuck and limited all of a sudden like the the roof just blew off of all of those and I within one year I did so much I did so much I launched my business I launched a podcast I ran that half marathon I wrote the first draft of my book like it was insane the just transformation and I knew that I really did find something you know I did so much self-discovery and introspection and all the research I did, I knew I found like a, f- a formula that works, a system that really works for other people. Not one in like s- buried in stigma, not one buried in like, you know, the kind of old fashioned paradigms, like, oh, you have a problem, you're perilous, but really in this, like, this is a self-discovery journey and you're going to discover so much about yourself. You're going to discover what really makes you happy and you're going to get the belief to go after it. And that's like my greatest joy now is to see my clients going through the same thing. Um, like that's what I do what I do. I don't, I don't care what people drink at the end of the day, right? I care that people are alive to their life and their deeper dreams. And personally, it's just the best transformation I've witnessed um, with this transformation through alcohol versus like, 
no offense, but like removing gluten from your life or sugar, I'm sure they change your life too. But <laughs> this is like, this just goes everywhere. It just goes through every dimension of your life. It really does. Cause you're standing up to society. You really are. Yeah. How, so with all that year of transformation, how did, did your relationships change or the people around you started noticing, what are you doing, Carolina? Something about you, you're shining more than before. Yeah. I remember I had friends at work say like, I look like I was 16 again. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I looked a lot better, but um, I really did feel like it completely deepened my relationships because first of all, like there was a part of me that because I was always reaching for a drink when I was out socializing, that was scared of my authentic self. That was really scared to just step into her power and her vulnerability too. And so I always masked her. I always masked her. I was always grabbing a drink. And so being able to just be my authentic, intrinsic self with my friends, with my, even my partner, it developed our relationship so deeply. You know, I was able to talk about something that's like a taboo topic and finally share kind of vulnerabilities. I was able to talk about things like fears, but also bigger dreams, you know? So a lot of my relationships did deepen. And I fundamentally believe that like, you can just listen and ask better questions when you're fully present, you know, like there is a lot to say about that. And, you know, even exploring with other ways of bonding. So for example, my husband and I, like we did drink together before, so we needed a new kind of date night. And so we actually signed up for half marathon together and we started going on running dates, you know, and when you're running like four or five, seven miles at a time, like it's a lot of time to talk <laughs> if you're not running. Too fast. <laughs> so, like we had this like new thing to do. We played a lot of board games, you know, and I would say my relationships have deepened and, and not just the ones I had, but the new friends I've made all over the world, not just with alcohol free women, but just other women who are just into their own personal growth. I couldn't be more grateful for that. You know, like the people I'm surrounding myself with, it's just like, they're hungry for a life of more of showing up to what that more means for them, you know, and really living aligned with their values and their dreams. And that has been just a huge blessing, you know, cause like they say, we emulate the five people we hang out with the mm -hmm. most and you know, if the five people you hang out with the most have like identities that are rooted in partying or going out every weekend or, or whatever, it's kind of hard to see how your life could be different, you know? Yeah, because you only know what you know. And okay. we tend to play small, we can't imagine. So the fact that I love that you mentioned, it also kind of opened space for the fears that you weren't necessarily making space for and then allowing yourself to dream bigger because so often people feel stuck and they feel that they can't pursue something and it's a mix of fears and all of that but it's also because they don't think they're capable of more and there's certain elements that are like dampening your the way you view the world and in this case like alcohol is one of them and people use many other different ways to numb or to <laughs> to you know to feel that. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Jessica, you know, when I was younger, before I, I started drinking, I had the biggest dreams for my life. I thought I would be like a New York Times bestselling author. I thought I'd win the Nobel Prize. I thought all this incredible stuff. And then I started drinking and, you know, adulthood kind of smacked me on the face, like here, get an entry level job and all this kind of stuff. But I kind of lost, I lost all hope. And I was just like, what was I thinking? Like, you know, and I, I kind of settled into this version of mediocrity. And drinking just helped that be okay. It was like, you don't have to try. You don't have to show up. You don't have to go out there and go for your dreams. You can just drink every weekend. It'll be fine. And so in many ways, you know, it took a lot of introspection to figure this out. But in so many ways, alcohol was giving me permission to play small. You know, like it's so much easier to open a bottle of wine than to write the next great American novel. It's so much easier to open a bottle of wine and go out there and like build your movement or your business. And it literally did, like I said, give me that permission to not try. And yet that was also one of the most painful things ever. Yeah. And now you've kind of picked the other way where you hold space for all the fears, all the excitement as well. And you're able to do so much more and empower others to do so. So usually how long are your programs with your clients? Yeah. So I, um, I work with either eight week kind of really in-depth programs, or I do 16 weeks of one-on-one -on -one coaching, which I just love. Um, and so my flagship course is called Become Euphoric. And that 
kind of just walks you through everything we just talked about, you know, like Mm -hmm. the body, the mind, the soul, and really like uprooting those beliefs that don't serve you and replacing them with new ones. Um, And then one-on-one coaching is just like my favorite thing, you know, because our thoughts are on autopilot and most of them are negative and most of them repeat on a loop, you know? So having someone there to actually like reflect your thoughts back and challenge them and offer you, help you off, like institute new ones is such a powerful pattern interrupter. And it really, I think, can manifest so many changes in a really quick container. So I swear by coaching. I have a coach. I, you know, we have coaches in our our mastermind group. It's just, just something that's super transformational for your life. So what are some lessons you've learned as you worked on your mindset? Oh gosh, (laughs) so many. And, you know, I'm such a student of personal growth. I continue growing myself. I continue to invest in programs and coaching and conferences. I listen to podcasts. I read all the books. So this is like just my favorite area, but it's really what it comes down to is mindset. You know, it's like, the technical, the logistical, the strategy, the like what you should do stuff is 20%. 80% is our mindsets. Like we are the only thing standing in our way. And most of those things that are standing in our way are fear, you know, like fear. We have such a huge fear of success, like fear of failure too. But I think it's the fear of success that catches us off guard even more. You know, like I think we fear that if we really do design this life of our dreams, we'll alienate everyone else, we'll lose belonging, we'll lose acceptance from the tribe, you know? And so like the mindset stuff to actually believe that, yes, you have your dreams for a reason. Like they're not random. They were given to you by something else that's bigger than you. And it is your destiny to carry them out. And you have everything inside of you that you need to carry them out. And I know that that can be terrifying. You know, even someone on the beginning of maybe launching a business or scaling a business or whatever it is, it's terrifying. And yet, like, you wouldn't even have the inclination. You wouldn't even have the desire if if it wasn't all meant for you. You know, doing what I do, we we, we deconstruct and reevaluate the role of alcohol a lot. But like I said, I also make so much room to help women design lives they love and really discover what their inner passions and purpose are. And from working with so many women, like the dreams I've been able to witness are so uncanny. Like they're so different. Like someone wants to be a professional hula hoop dancer. Someone else wants to be like founding an animal sanctuary. Someone else wants to write a book. Someone else wants to be a yoga teacher. Like there's a reason why they're so unique because they're unique to like our destinies, you know? Yeah, that was beautifully put. (laughs) And it's funny, I am glad you brought up the fear of success because so many of us have that, but we don't recognize it. We're like, of course not. Of course I want to be successful. Just like I thought, I don't have a money mindset problem. Of course I want all the money. (laughs) But as you dig in deeper, that's when you learn about layers of how you react to certain scenarios and how you maybe just the way you think about something is kind of filtered through your childhood stories that you started building up oh it's so true i love money mindset stuff too so it's like where do we have complicated relationships with things like money alcohol (laughs) all this kind of stuff right and it's just a tool to like remove the blocks so you can let your full radiance shine your full light shine right yeah and what happens usually to your clients after they realize or they're confronted with their mindset blocks yeah so um they are given the tools, you know, to really work through them. And it's not like a overnight process, obviously. It's not something that's like, you know, fixed like that, but it's something that you work on and you keep working on. And the things that used to hold you back or, you know, up at night, they go away, you know, like certain fears go away and then you grow and there's new ones. (laughs) And it's like a process of, you know, really going on this journey. It's a lifelong journey, but you know, I I don't know who said it right now, but it's not, it's not the attainment of the goal. It's not even sobriety. It's not about being alcohol free. It's not about the stuff. It's about who you become in the process, right? It's who you become in the process of of going after your dreams. It's who you become in the process of going alcohol free. It's who you go in the process of becoming the authentic version of you. And I think that's like a beautiful capsulation of just like, it, it really is about the journey. 
you know, and we keep growing. And the thing is, that's great because one of our biggest human needs is to grow. <laughs> we actually feel super stagnant and super unfulfilled when we're not growing. So the, the, the opportunity for us to continually be confronted with new things is incredible. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to really grow our souls and expand our souls at the same time, you know? Yeah, thinking, thank you for bringing the process part. I think a lot of people, especially when they first learn about their mindset blocks, I knew I at the beginning was like, okay, I know this is my block. I, I've got this now. And then I kept getting lessons that were bringing me back to, well, you haven't completely healed that mindset or you still, you're still afraid of showing up. You're still afraid of it. all those things. And I was like, oh, it takes time, even though I have the tools and then another one will come. But it's also, like you said, the journey. It's not about like the message that I've been getting more and more as I do this inner work is that life is to be enjoyed. Like all that healing, yeah, it's it's bonus, it's part of the process, but you need to just enjoy it. Whatever you love eating, what you like doing, the place you want to live, it's to be enjoyed and not through suffering like we always put ourselves in. Yeah. And I think like, I think what I knew was my problem before is I didn't know what I enjoyed, you know, like I couldn't, I've told you where I want to live, how my house looks, what do I do every day with my time? Cause I was, I was so disconnected, I think with that like deeper part of myself. And so anytime we give ourselves the space to just go within, we learn what we want. And sometimes we have to learn what we want by what we don't want. <laughs> mm, right. Yes. That is such an important <laughs> point. Yeah. A lot of people think I know I don't want to do this. And then they're like, but I don't know what else I want. And I see frustration. And what are some areas? How do you help people navigate when all they know is that I don't want to do this anymore? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, mean, I help a lot of women who might sometimes feel like regretful or they wasted a lot of time, mm-hmm. like living in that status quo and just drinking like what they we call normally, but still in a very stuck place there often is that like regret. Oh, I wasted so much time living that way, you know? And it's like, well, like that to learn about what you don't want is a powerful, powerful lesson because now you can create a life based on the opposite of that, based on what you do want, you know? And I think it takes, it takes time to discover those answers, but we continue doing that by giving us moments of meditation, of silence, of solitude, of of really reflecting, of visualizing, of of just personal growth work, you know, it really does come from that. And just like a really silly example, I used to have like no sense of like style or or design when it came to my house. So my house had like whatever furniture, my husband and I like didn't agree. So we would just get like something we compromised on. It was like all dark. I don't know. It just, and I had no idea how to fix it. I knew I didn't like it, but it just was, it was just not one of those people who's like a graphic or not a graphic, but you know, does interior designers. Yeah. <laughs> and today, like I live in a house that I love. I love the way my house looks, I've designed it in a way that I love. And it's so interesting how like I could have carried that story for so long. Like, oh, I'm just not an interior designer. I don't know how that stuff works, you know? Mm-hmm. Whereas it took a while to kind of peel back the layers. And I think for me, giving up alcohol was like the crucial thing to really figure out what I wanted, you know? Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that story because I can definitely relate to holding on to stories that I know don't serve me. Like I have the story that I'm not good with numbers. So every time finances come up, I I just like, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to do anything. As long as I can pay my bills, I'm okay. But I'm working on it. I'm working on taking ownership and then getting comfortable. <laughs> oh, I love that. You know, and like, I think that's the most powerful um, motivator of human behavior is our identity. You know, if we think we're an athlete, we'll work out every day. If we identify as, you know, someone who can't do something, we'll be like, oh, I'm a procrastinator. I'm lazy. Okay, we'll do that too, you know? And I I heard this just recently. It's like, who decided you were that or this? Like when, you know, how long ago did you decide that you're not good at numbers or that you're not, you know, good at this or that? And how does it apply to who you're growing into be? You know, you can change the beliefs you have about your identity at any moment, really. You know what I mean? And it's a really powerful reframe. Like, cause it, you might've decided that back in high school and does that serve you right today? Or did it serve me kind of a thing? Yes, totally. Like I always look back to high school and I felt very inadequate there just because getting good grades was so hard. It was such a struggle, but now I learned 
that that's not how I learn. I'm better visually, I'm better interacting, I'm better at doing things than sitting in a classroom and being taught at. But for the longest time, I thought, oh, I must be dumb. That was a story I was holding on to. And now it's like, no, I was just in the wrong environment. And flipping that script, it's so empowering and liberating to make space for more. Yeah, yeah, I love that. What are, what are some of the most, or what, what is one of the best feedback you've ever gotten from your clients? <laughs> um, it's like, I get goosebumps, I get like butterflies, I get just all this incredible feelings because I get to see these like transformations and feedback almost every week. Like I'm getting messages on my phone and stuff, but just this incredible life change, like that they cannot believe, you know, like just a few months ago, the highlight of their week was, you know, wine and Netflix. And now that they're actually not just not drinking, that's like almost besides the point. They're stepping into these dreams that they had long time ago, put back on the back burner of someday. And they're actually going for them today. And like the, the shock of that, like just the gratitude, it's almost like we kind of sleepwalk through life. Right. And, and it happens in so many ways. It happens through bad habits. It happens through, you know, maybe drinking. It happens just by being on a like hamster wheel of, maybe even doing something that society expects us to do. Like, you know, you could sleepwalk through your whole twenties cause you're trying to get advanced degrees and then this promotion and right. I mean, you could do it your whole life really. Like we just don't see anything from a bigger perspective. We see very granularly and we don't really prioritize what matters. We're going for status or recognition versus family or, or meaning or friends or connection. And so when you're able to wake up from that, you know, and people have transformations in all kinds of different ways. But when you wake up from sleepwalking, I don't think you ever go back. You never do. You're awakened to your life. You're awakened to the magnitude of it, to your power to design it the way you want. You're awakened to like your ability to be an active agent and go after the life you've always wanted. And that realization, I mean, that's worth, that's, that's priceless, right? And to be able to witness that in my clients and then you know, their celebration around it or, or their gratitude around it. It's so fulfilling for me. And I can see why I went on the journey I went through. So my mess has turned into my message, you know, like I'm able to help so many people through this because of what I went through. And I've found those things that I've always wanted, like deeper meaning and fulfillment and purpose through it, you know, and it's it sounds almost too lofty to say, but I truly do believe that our purposes are tied with helping or inspiring other people. And you could do that in so many different ways. You know, you could bring joy to people through baked goods or whatever it is. Yeah. But until we find that, you know, and, and there's a, obviously it's a process, but like we're meant to help people. We go through hard things so that we can teach someone else how to go through it. And it doesn't have to be so hard for them, you know, and we experience just life so that we can guide others through the same thing. There's this great um, theory about a good story always has a hero, a guide, and a challenge. So in like most movies and most stories, there's a hero and it gets a challenge. You know, they have to save the princess. They have to defeat the dragon. They have to do something and they have to work on themselves in order to do that. You know, it's not easy challenge. But then there's always a guide that comes in and that guide helps them. Maybe it's, you know, in Lord of the Rings or mm -hmm. Mr. Miyagi and Karate Kid and <laughs> help them through it. And then they win the challenge. They win the day, you know, whatever it is, they overcome. And ultimately that hero turns into a guide for someone else. Mm -hmm. Right. And so our lives go through this trajectory. You know, we're all the heroes of our own story. But where we're going to find the most meaning and depth is when we transform into those guides and then help the person behind us. Mm, you gave me chills. That was beautiful, Carolina. <laughs> 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 well, I wanted to kind of wrap this up with some rapid fire questions. Sure. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Um, that I changed someone's life. Mm -hmm. What's the book that changed your life? The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Oh gosh, it's such a good book. <laughs> Do 
What does coming home to yourself mean? Being as expressive, as emboldened, as intrinsically me as I possibly can, finding quiet time for myself mostly to reflect and to really dig deep into who I want to be, um, and moments in nature. I think every single time I've been outside at night and just looked up at the stars, like something bigger than me connects me to like the magnitude of life. And sometimes it's just like, we wake, we sleepwalk a little bit every day, right? We just have these moments that wake us up like that. It can be really beautiful. Something that I need to be reminded of, because like you said, we sleepwalk, I go on autopilot and then stress gets over. And then I realize, oh, if I just look at the clouds, I just, my shoulders drop, I can relax. So that's a nice reminder. Thank you. <laughs> What would you like more of? Mm -hmm. Freedom, love, abundance. Any advice or words for your younger self? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you know, like even when you shared a little bit about your high school, you know, learning kind of style, like I think the hardest part of sometimes of growing up is thinking that we are alone in what we're dealing with and that somehow I'm the only one who feels this way. And so I remember feeling so insecure and really when I graduated college, like I thought everyone had it all figured out but me. I was the only one who didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, the only one who didn't get like a great job out of college, you know? So it's always been this theme in my whole life of feeling like I'm alone because I'm different and realizing that not only is there nothing wrong with you, but the ways you're different is literally your greatest gift. That's your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find you? Yeah, my website is uh, www.euphoricaf.com. Um, you'll find information about me. I have a free five-day course if you want to get started. I have all these uh, mocktail recipes up and podcasts. And then you can also find me on Instagram at euphoric.af. Mm, I wanted to ask you more about your podcast. What is the podcast about? <laughs> It's called Euphoric, and it's about really finding your best life and freedom, alcohol-free. Um, we talk about really stepping into that most expressive, most emboldened version of you, um, can, challenging the conventions of society, but then also like hearing about really awesome different perspectives of other leaders who have grown themselves through different kind of areas. So, yeah, it's possible to go to the other side if you want to. <laughs> Um, you also just launched or are launching a program. Yeah, so I do group coaching as well. And so that's one of my favorite things as well to take the one on one format and do it in a group format. I just so many incredible connections you make with the women you're you're with. And it's just such a heartening way to, you know, like learn and to really challenge each other, inspire each other. So I love that. Um, and then I just also want to shout out that I have a book coming out as well uh, next January 2022. It's called Euphoric as well. Um, and that's just like, like I told you earlier, my biggest dream when I was a little girl was to write and publish a book. And so I, I, I just can't even believe it. And yet the perseverance, you know, it took like just one step in front of the other baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. I can't believe like that's how it happens. You have to just believe you have to just keep going for it. Don't get overwhelmed by like the magnitude of a project. Just take one baby step and then the universe will show you the next right one to take. Mm, how is the process for writing the book so far? It's it's incredible, you know, like being able to say you've written a book, it's no easy feat. It's, it's, it's challenging and it's kind of like, oh my gosh, you want to put everything in there, right? Everything you've ever learned. But uh, the manuscript's almost done. So we're moving into the marketing, into the cover design, just crazy stuff like you know it's it's really surreal congratulations carolina well deserved Thank you <laughs> and you'll help so many with your story as well that would totally resonate well thank you so much for joining me today i've learned so much from you and i know our listeners will be super super inspired by your story is there anything else you want to share yeah i think if you're hearing an inner voice telling you something She's never going to lead you astray or he, <laughs> they know deeper. They're the connection to our higher self, their connection to that source. So, you know, when you hear it whispering to you in the morning, Monday mornings, 
specifically to, just listen to that voice. You'll never regret it. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Carolina. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com slash podcast for more information.